as free as anyone. Mm. We never expect to be out of anything in the, especially in this year, because we we haven't done that well. Did we did eighty five? It was well, the beginning of eighty five. I suppose for si six months we we uh, the first six months we were uh, we did a lot of work in in, in the United States, mm. and uh, I suppose that accounts for some of it. But uh, there were some pretty other, you know, some pretty good bands around as well, like Bruce Springsteen and people like that. Yeah. So uh, you haven't been in touch with them since the poll was announced, no? No, I'm sure he's not speaking to us <laughs> now. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Larry, can we um, can we go right back to the beginning? You've talked about this before, but perhaps not on RTE that often. You actually formed the band, right? Mm -hmm. And you pin the notice on the school notice board. Do you remember what you were doing that day, what you were looking for? Had you any idea what you were getting yourself into? No idea. All I knew was I'd spent all my like, pocket money on drum kits and suddenly you get to the stage after playing in your bedroom for six months so you, you wonder where to go, you know. Mm. So I um, just thought it would be a good idea maybe if I just stuck a, a notice up just on the off chance that somebody might be interested in somebody with an accordion <laughs> might come along and be able to do some can you traditional the, uh, Irish music or something like that, you know? Can you remember the wording of the notice that you put up? Can you remember what exactly you were looking for? No, Help, it was I think <laughs> something like that, yeah. Help. But uh, certainly I know nothing really, I didn't think about it. I just sort of said, well, maybe somebody would be interested. I didn't think I would be interested in forming, forming a rock band. Mm. I mean, if somebody with an accordion had come along, I would have played with them, you know? <laughs> that, was, that was where I was at. I was that desperate to play with so somebody. So you had the Kill for Nori Cayley band touring. Yeah, I mean, it, it, yeah, that would have done the job. You you know? It was when he found out it was going to be a punk rock band that uh, the, uh, the confusion began, actually. Indeed. Coming from the Artane Boys band and... Uh, being told to get his hair cut, I think, was a bit much. <laughs> Did you know the other guys, Larry, when you when you pinned that up at the time? No, I would heard of this fella called Paul Hewson. Like he was fairly notorious. That's not fair. Remember correctly, mildly, but, mildly. And then there was there was Adam because Adam was a new boy in town, and uh, he used to wear this fantastic Afghan coat. And that's how I knew Adam. That he had to get it. his coat cut before he could yeah. join. No, I, I didn't know the guys at all. Mm. What about the Edge? You didn't know him. No, no. knew none of them. You were mildly notorious. Why? How? I've no, I've, I've no idea. I mean, uh, but I mean, I was a bigger boy, wasn't I? I mean, I was 16 and he was only 14. So, I mean, any 16-year-old's notorious to a 14-year-old. Right, right. You know what I mean? Right. What were the early days like? I mean, can you remember the ah, first the rehearsal and stuff like that? Oh, it's yeah. like that Monty Python routine, you know. But well, if we were lucky, if we yeah. were lucky now. Yeah, try uh, telling that to you. I can remember scutting hours. home and stuff like that, you know, in the back of lorries uh, from, from Mount Temple. <laughs> but, you know, for us, I think for you too, I think it should be said that there are a lot of people uh, in this city a lot worse off than we were. Okay, uh, you know, we never got anything given to us on the plate, anything. Um, but there's a lot of people far worse off than we were. So I think it would be wrong for me, for Larry to talk about it the old days in any sense of we, we overcome all these obstacles. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of obstacles to overcome, but uh, there are other bands out there that are, you know, fighting for the price of strings. Sure. Not just the price of guitars, which is what we were fighting for. In fact, Adam, being a pushy from Malahide, he had a, an amplifier, and uh, we all plugged into his amplifier. And uh, yeah, we used to, you know, we got, we got great value out of it, but as I say, I think we were very lucky in some mm. ways. Mm. Larry, had you any idea early on when the band started playing together and rehearsing, mm. had you an idea of the U2 sound that we now know? Well. Was that what actually were you doing then? What did you think the music would be totally like? totally directionless. I mean, it's the old cliche, we were going nowhere and we, were, we started to go nowhere together. That was basically it. We never ever sat down and thought about, well, this would be a great sound. I mean, we were basically influenced by things like uh, seeing the pistols at a clash or even the jam on top of the pops just mm. saying wow this is something new so we would just come out of like the the whole hippy dippy thing into the uh, new wave as such mm. so like we were fairly directionless you know mm. in uh, fact we're still fairly directionless <laughs> <laughs> how did that how did that, i mean you were talking about obstacles in your path i mean one of the obstacles was playing ability <laughs> technique all that sort of stuff. You really had to learn all about that, didn't you? Within the group. And we still group. haven't learned it. We still haven't learned it in, in, in so many ways. This group is just beginning. Mm. We're really just beginning. Things that I'm sure a lot of groups would find so easy, we find so difficult. Such as what? Um, 
playing in time. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, me learning the words, stuff like that, me even wanting to, to write the words. I mean, we tend to go about things very, I think, from musicians that I've met since, I think we go about things a lot differently. Um, we tend to just all start up, everyone just plugs in and we just start playing. Mm. And, uh, and then we play for about a half an hour and sometimes people are playing different songs but then at the end of the half an hour we play back the tape and we listen to the tape and somebody says, Edge, that was really good and Edge goes, yeah, I think that was pretty good and in fact what you did there was pretty good and we just Pieces literally with the needle and thread sew it together and it becomes mm. a song mm. I think a lot of other people sit down and write songs in a much more uh, disciplined Mm. Uh, fashion. Now structured we're, kind of way. Yeah, and structured kind of way. I wouldn't mind getting into a bit of that. Mm. Mm. But uh, that's for but, the future. Right. What about your own, Bonov, just concentrate on it for a second, your own development as a singer. I mean, you're now considered one of the best voices uh, no, in rock Liam. and roll. I know, I'm, I'm only saying it because you're sitting next to me. Uh, you're great as well. I know, I am. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you are, I mean, people generally perceive you. You get voted in the polls, the critics talk about you. Yeah. But early on, I mean, you were actually in danger of getting kicked out of the band because you didn't have a voice, yeah? Yeah, I, I fancy myself. I thought I'd be a lead guitar player, actually. And uh, in fact, everyone wanted to play the, uh, the guitar, as far as I remember. Even Larry was getting bored behind the drum kit, and he thought, yeah, yeah I quite like playing guitar. But... Uh, so then they stopped me playing lead guitar, and then I was on rhythm guitar, and then they stopped me playing rhythm guitar. Eventually, I think they wanted me to manage the group, but I, I wouldn't leave the stage. Mm. I felt uh, I'd be better off on a stage than behind the scenes. So I began, began as a singer, but I was a really lousy, rotten singer. See, this, this I've, is just, I've just actually recently learned how to use my voice, mm. though I've never had a lesson in my life. Mm -hmm. well, how do you actually develop? I mean, the thing is, there are a lot of people forming bands and they worry about the fact that so-and-so, I'm not a great singer, I can never compete with the voice on that record or whatever. How do you develop the voice? How do you find your own voice? How do you get that kind of confidence? Uh, blind faith and ignorance, probably. Mm. A combination of the two. Mm. I, I never tried to copy anyone. I remember, uh, I remember singing in an English accent um, early on. I remember Normally, singing. Irish accents, they, you know, the country and western singers, they sing an American voice. So I remember I got into, you know, my voice, I started singing an English accent. I listened back to the tape and said, who is that guy? And I said, that guy's you. Mm. I said, but I don't have an English accent. Mm. And uh, I remember that. It's trying to sort through your influences, I think, is a big deal. And not, trying not to imitate other people, but rather create in, in yourself. Right, which, which you did. With we love lots of people in the audience who want to ask questions and possibly a few phone calls as well. Right now we'll take a commercial break. If you come back in a few minutes, join us for the fourth and final part of the show. Bye. Hey, Larry. Oh, you've so met? Oh, yes, I know, Peter. <laughs> I'd like to ask Larry, what musical advantages did you get out of being a template considered you wouldn't get anywhere else? Well, um, I suppose just the fact that we pushed for, for things that nobody else, that we asked for things that people hadn't asked for before, so um, teachers and that sort of said, well, we can't do any harm and all that sort of stuff. So, got things like rooms um, to rehearse, and that's about it, just, just things like rooms, we're able to stay there late, but when it started interfering with exam results and all that, and uh, then other, other kids were sort of saying, well, why can't I play in a band as well, and you know, all that. So, I, I had it adv his, its advantages and disadvantages as well. Right, another hand up, over way over here in the corner. Hiya. Have a sound like you too. Would you encourage that, or would you prefer you get their own individual sound? I think that's a very good question. Um, some people say that you know, I've, some people have come to me and they said, "Hey, Bono, I've got a band. That sounds just like you too." Well, you just then you've got the the point. You know, you've really got the the wrong end of the stick because. You know, one thing, always what you two stood for was trying to find our own way. And we would never want anyone to try and find our way. They should find their, their own way. And, uh, you know, everyone walks and talks differently. Everyone has their own original way about them. If they just apply that to their music, their music will be as original. And that's very important not to imitate you two because you two are doing well. Now, the, the, the record companies in America and, and England will always be looking for you two part two. And then next week it'll be somebody else. Next week, uh, somebody else. Best thing is just to find out what's going on in your own 
band. And a lot of hands going up, up at the very, very back. Sorry, yeah. Hiya. Hiya. <laughs> Do you resent people saying that I'm, you know, I'm really into you too because their message and I can relate to that? Because you said on um, MTSA with Vincent Hanley that you had a message but you weren't the postman. Like, you know. <laughs> that was very deep. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I don't know. There are many different, uh, I mean, different sides to the group U2. And I used to look down uh, on, you know, people who are just into uh, U2 because, you know, the Edge is a great guitar player. We make a lot of noise. And I'd like them to think, be into U2 because of, you know, what U2 stand for. But now I think, whatever, whatever you see in U2 that uh, works for you, that's okay. I think that's the, actually the strength of the group, is that there are different sides. Yeah, one journalist put it very well, said U2's music is for the head, the heart and for the feet. Mm. Probably yeah. me, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> it's very deep. <laughs> Listen, Larry, I want to go back, um, this is a slightly sad note, but we were talking about the beginnings early on. And uh, I know Philip Linnett was uh, a friend, an advisor and an encouraging person on the sidelines for the band early on. Presumably you were quite devastated when you heard the news of his sure. death. Yeah, I mean, uh, we didn't know him like as a person, a friend, we didn't see him all the time, but just uh, the fact that he was there at the, at the very beginning when we did need a hand, like he just offered his advice. He was always around, he never bitched about any other Irish band, which mm. there's an awful lot of bitching goes on now mm. between bands, which is pretty awful. And, you know, it was pretty devastating when he did die, because he's... I yeah. I tell you, that's one thing he's left, a legacy. It's an example that we picked up on, and I hope then that people will pick up on maybe the example that, that we could leave. Because I think the single biggest obstacle to Irish, you know, to Dublin groups uh, in particular, the single biggest obstacle is their own ability to stab each other in the back. Um, you just walk through, it's only a very small city, but well, they say, no pond is too small for a feud between frogs. And you want to see them feuding around Grafton Street. You can't find two bands that will say a good word about each other. It makes me sick. Mm. And uh, it's just, you know, instant karma is going to get you. They're just hanging themselves. They're putting a rope around their own neck. If you go to Belfast, you'll see groups of different styles, different musical styles. But you won't see them fighting amongst each other the way you'll see them down here. Phil in it, what he stood for, for me, and you know, Adam was the first person that came in contact with him. He rang him. I mean, uh, even Adam would admit, he ra ringing somebody at 8 o'clock in the morning, okay, uh, if they're in the band business, is not a good idea. But he rang him at 8 o'clock in the morning to ask him some advice. Mm. Now, I mean, even, I mean, I think even Adam would probably tell somebody, listen, ring me in a few hours, and he put, Phil in it was there, oh yeah, uh, it's 8 o'clock in the morning, but, uh, and he offered advice. Mm. And you never heard him bitching about other bands. I never heard him bitching about other bands. Right. <laughs> and that is a legacy that he, he left to me. And I think that if others were aware about that, we could help, you know, people in bands could look after each other in bands. Even to the extent of lending each other gear. You might think the group's music is not you, what you're into. But a bit of cooperation, I think, would be a good thing to see. Mm. Larry, there is this uh, Phil Linnett Memorial anti-drug concert sure. being organised in London. You were express expressing some grievances uh, about that or some worries? Yeah, I, I just felt that it, w it was a little bit in bad taste, the fact that, you know, I just I sort of put myself in the situation of being his family. Suddenly you see this thing um, in memory of Phil in an anti-heroin campaign like less than two weeks after the guys mm -hmm. passed away. Mm -hmm. I just thought it was in bad taste and I totally disagree w with that you know, with using his name, obviously I'm, I, I like the idea of an anti-heroin campaign, but using Phil Linnett's name uh, in it um, like a week after his death was really offensive to me and I know for a fact it was offensive to his family. Mm. Despite know? presumably the fact that the people organising it... Uh, I'm sure they got the best, best will in the world, yeah. but I mean it, it was like something that they obviously did off the top of their heads and didn't think that seriously about, you know, mm. and I wish they had. Right. Moving on to major gigs you've played, uh, Live Aid, was that a spectacularly memorable day for you? Because a lot of people in Ireland watch you playing in London. Well, Linda time. McCartney kissed me there. Did you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Actually, that was the hi highlight for me was, uh, was standing beside Paul McCartney. I shared a microphone with Paul McCartney. I just felt his genius just jumping, <laughs> climbing up my arm and stuff. 
And I went back to the others and I said, look, I think I've got some of Paul McCartney's genius just there. And, uh, and they said, you know, that was a cool thing. Mm. But I really liked, uh, I really liked the day. Mm. I really liked seeing the way bands behaved with each other. Because you were talking about young bands sharing, helping mm. each other out. Larry, that was a day when some of the real established superstars seemed to yeah, do it. It really was incredible that bands were like given fifth, told they got 15 minutes on stage and they were finished in 15 minutes. I've never ever seen a band, including ourselves, <laughs> keep to a time, you know, and there were all these sort of stars sitting out, you know, talking to each other. It was absolutely, it was, it was great. It was mm. from, from a, a whole lot of points of view, but that one really stood out with me, the fact that, you know, everyone was sort of just goofing around, no hassle. You know, mm. there's no egos. These little fellas going into the dressing rooms and saying, David Bowie, get out of your dressing room. And he was going, oh, yes, yeah, right, right away. You know, <laughs> picking up his things and off he was going, you know. Yeah. Re I thought his performance, by the way, was one of the best performances. Mm. Um, mm. Heroes, I thought, mm. was outstanding. Was there a genuine sense of community on the day? Because there is a temptation to see that in the euphoria of the day, everybody chipped in, did their bit, yeah. but that that would all fade away and all these various musicians would completely go their own way. Has it left a legacy within the music world, let alone everything else, that live aid day, do you think? Uh, Linda McCartney sending me love letters. Did she really, yeah? Just no. call no. No, th <laughs> actually, there has been a, a s some continuation. Uh, one of my favourite moments, actually, was uh, I was talking to the guy from Queen, Freddie Mercury, and uh, the other guitar player uh, came up, you know, the guitar player in Queen, this big tall guy, and he kind of, he says, Hey, that was really good, uh, really good out there. Um, you got a great guitar player in your group. And I says, yeah, yeah, you're a great guitar player too. And he says, yeah, give my regards to the hedge. <laughs> oh, <lovely. laughs> I love it. I swear to you, you know, there were, you know was it things like that at the hedge, yeah? All right. Crazy. <laughs> Back to our audience, Gan, there were a number of people in the red scarf there, yeah? Um, you are talking about um, bands helping each other. Um, how did you get involved with Clannad? I mean, I know it's, a, it's above the scale that we were talking about, but how did you get involved with Clannad? Um, I've been a fan of, of traditional music um, for the last about two years. And one of the things I feel very guilty about in some ways is my suburban background. I was born in, in, in Ballymun, and just in between Ballymun and Finglas, and I, I kind of resent the fact that uh, we didn't grow up in a, uh, you know, listening to traditional music and anything like that. In fact, I would have, at the time, I grew up kind of sneering at traditional music, the diddly idol, we used to call it. Um, but I've since come to realize that traditional music has so much, uh, you know, has so much to offer. Contemporary music in its rhythm, in its tone and the textures. And I think that as well as just being uh, a remnant, as well as just being folklore, it has a, a new significance as, as we become more dehumanized our city, in our city lives. And uh, I think the group Clannad, they had an incredible marriage between the past, you know, the, the technology they were using, the synthesizers, and uh, the, the modern, a modern sense to their music, com combined with songs that were a thousand years old and that was unique and that got me interested in Clannad and I've always been a fan. Did they approach you? Did, did they approach you? Um, was the song written with you in mind? No it wasn't actually. The song wasn't written with, with, me, with me in mind. They just said, you know, the record company had said to, to, uh, to the group, to Clannad, you know, would you be interested you know, in, in singing with a few characters. She named a few guys and she, she didn't seem, they didn't seem to click with her. She said, well, I wouldn't mind you singing with, with Bono. So they invited you, yeah. <laughs> That's what, you know, That's some papers, papers so, sort of yeah. gutter press will always look for an angle. Yeah. So since, um, as you so mentioned, since I've been involved with Clannad as a group, people mm -hmm. trying to think that Moya and myself are um, getting along too well. Of course, Moya is more like a sister. <laughs> than anything else. Mm. But, um, so, yeah, sorry, what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> Whether they asked you, well, in fact, wait, can I just interrupt and say that, that that is one of your extra curricular activities, if you will, outside you too. Larry, you have uh, been playing on Paul Brady's forthcoming album, because he That's mentioned right. to us on our show on Students mm. Night. What, what exactly is your involvement there? Well, I, I met Paul, uh, oh, 
couple of years ago, and um, I, I was then last Christmas, not last Christmas, Christmas before then, I met him again in London, and I, I was saying that I didn't feel like a real musician because I'd never done a session, you know, mm. I'd only played with you two. And he said, well, would you be into doing a session? And I said, yeah, but you'll have to organise as a real session. I said, send me a tape when I come into the studio, like I was being a big boy, yeah? So um, he organised and sent me over a tape, um, it was about in September, October, and uh, I went over to London and just played over this track. Mm. I'd never heard it before. Just it was just it was a different angle, something I'd never done before. I always liked Paul Brady stuff anyway. He's a nice guy as well. Yeah, yeah. How did it feel to be actually behind the kit with somebody who wasn't Bono or The Edge or Larry out there? It was very him? strange, but it was it was a good feeling. It was really you know it was an adventure. I mean, I didn't do anything incredibly different on it. I mm. mean, I played the way I play, but just the idea of I wasn't you know wasn't with the band. I mean, I suppose Bono would tell you himself when you're working with other people. Y then you realise why you're in a band or why, you, you know, because although it's great fun and all that, um, being in a band is, is what it's all about, you know. Right. Now, can I just mention that Karen from Stillorgan phoned to say she paid 50p to see you two in the Dandelion years ago and £12 to see you last year. Now, reading between the lines, I suppose her point is... Inflation, is it? Inflation. It's inflation, all right. The oh problem geez. is that the bigger you get... Either dead me. The bigger you get, the bigger the gigs you play. Inevitably now, at a time of recession, not a lot of people who are U2 fans can afford 12 quid to see you. Is that yeah. a, one of those compromises you have to live with, given the, how big the band has become? Yeah. Um, well, I agree with you, in one sense. Um, what I don't, where I don't agree with you is, sometimes people say to you, um, why should I pay 12 quid to see you in Croke Park, only pay 50p to see you in the Dandelion Market? They won't think twice about paying 15 pounds to see Bruce Springsteen in the same venue, maybe. And that, uh, you know, th I think uh, when, when we, when the ticket price was set at, t at, at, at 12 pounds, we tried to make up a bill with other acts right through from squeeze, uh, the alarm, whatever. Um, we think it was worth 12 pounds. I mean, I really believe it was worth 12 pounds. Mm. Uh, uh, I can see though that uh, if you haven't got 12 pounds, that's a right pain in the backside. Mm. Well, you did uh, also last year go down to Cork for a freebie gig, a surprise gig. Was that a bit special? I mean, most of mm. the U2 crew are from uh, the city by the Lee, aren't they? I love Cork. I suppose, you see, the question you're asking me, I haven't really got an answer for. And Cork was trying to come to terms with the fact that we're a big group now. We haven't got all the answers yet. We haven't really worked it out. Mm. I mean, I would go away and I would think, 12 pounds to CO2. And, you know, I, I would actually think about it. And I would talk to uh, our manager about it and he, he would ex it, we would explain. But I knew before we played Croke Park that we were giving the money away, mm. and that made it a lot easier. You're talking about the city centre <coughs> The project. city centre, mm. the rehearsal rooms. Mm. I knew where every penny of that £12 was going. Mm. But one thing I didn't want to do was, was announce that we were giving the money away from Croke Park before the gig, because it's our money to give away. Mm. You, know, it weren't, you know, that was a point we had to make. And... and uh, I don't know, it's very hard to justify being in a sure. big group. I think we're really overpaid. I mean, I think we're really overpaid, and I can't justify the position. Mm. I mean, I'm, we wrestle with it all the time ourselves. The only answers we can come up with is we try to make the best records we can make. We try to play the best live concerts we can play. Right. Some more questions over here in the second row, uh, yeah? What do you think is the most promising group in Ireland at the moment? Most promising group in Ireland at the moment. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots. There's a lot of promising groups. And what do you think is the main one? It's hard to say the main <coughs> one. It is a hard one. You know, like yesterday, my favourite group in Ireland was the Subterraneans. Uh, I think they're from Artane. The day before that, it was the Hothouse Flowers. Uh, the day before that, it was Operating Theatre. I mean, it just goes on. I think the standard of uh, groups now around this city and around the rest of the cities in Ireland is far higher than when we were starting out. Yeah. Mm. This country could explode. This country could really explode because <laughs> Irish music has got a lot of soul. Mm. It's soul music because cause we as a, as a people, I think, are just capable of getting out there. Are you in a band? No, no. 
You know? <laughs> I thought when the guy was patting you on the shoulder, he was <laughs> saying, you're a band. Is there anybody here who's in a band? That, that guy up there. Listen, that's a good yeah, point. You, what was your question? I was just saying I'm in a band. <laughs> <laughs> Good is, question. Is, do, you think, do you think you're in a position you're now, not the singer, then. we were talking earlier about bands aping you two, and you obviously that's not a good thing, but to a band starting out in Dublin now, is there actual sound practical advice that you can give them, drawn yeah. from your own experience? You, there's one thing, it's taken me seven years, I think, to learn this, because people, when I bump into people uh, in the band business, they talk about managers, and they talk about agents and uh, how important it is to have a manager or an agent, and indeed it is important. But, you know, writing one song, right, will ma that song could manage you, that song can be your agent, that song could, can change your life. Mm. Three and a half minute song, and you can write it, right, uh, you can write it on two strings. I Will Follow is written on two strings of a guitar, I mean, you know, uh, on two chords, on three chords, knocking on heaven's door, four chords. Right. Most right. of the classic songs ever written were written on three or four chords. So the message is go for it and actually write that song. It's the yeah? songs that yeah. are important. We, you two came to the fore on a sound. Mm. I would suggest to people that the songs now are the most important. Can I see if I can take a phone call here oh. on line six? Hello? Hello? Hi, how are you? Hello. That's a real problem hearing you. Right. Did you get that? Oh, yeah. Okay, thanks for calling. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. The difference is uh, between the audiences in America and the audiences in Dublin, apart from the accent. Uh, audiences in America, they hoot. <laughs> I think uh, Barbara Lee would own up to that. They go, whoo, right. you, like that one. You know, if you'd walked in here, they'd all be hooting. I find, uh, I mean, I have a kind of love-hate relationship with America. I love it. Mm. I really love it. I mean, I hate the violence. I hate the people being gunned down in the street, the impersonal uh, thing about living in tall buildings in small cities. But I love the wide open plains of America. And I find that the audiences are also wide open, quite naive and quite up for you at the mm. same time. They're not cynical in the way that, say, a London audience can be very cynical. Mm. Mm. Listen, can I ask a, a question which Rory MacDonald from Carlo uh, would like answered. Very basic one, really. What about the next album? What about it? <laughs> what about the next album? Well, have you have you any idea at this stage what it's going to sound like when we might hear it? Anything at all? No, we're, we're back to our old friend, Directionless. Yeah. Um, we just we're start rehearsing again. We were rehearsing just before Christmas, so just back rehearsing, plugging in, just just basically messing being around, being a band. It's like after being on the road for so long. It, you know, it takes so much out of you, both physically and mentally. And sometimes you lose contact, like you're in hotel rooms, you're playing gigs and all those sort of things. And uh, it's great to actually get back to be a band. We've had six months off. I've not, right. I haven't had six months off in five years. Right. You well, know? listen, it is good to have you both in tonight. It's What's good to have all? you being a oh, band Liam. again. I think there might be more to come. Bono and Larry, do you two want to take yourselves over there? perhaps to attend to some unfinished un un business. business. And you can go out that way. And in the meantime, maybe all you people could give them an enormous round of applause. Thank you. Bono, can you go over?
It's about a mermaid. About a mermaid I met once. We met once in America. It's a song called uh, I Trip Through Your Wires. <laughs> the four chords we were talking about earlier on. It's only got four, four chords, it's very easy to play. It's written by a very famous man. Um, his, his name is Bob Dylan, the song is Knocking on Heaven's Door.
Mama, take this badge off of me I can't use it anymore It gets so dark I cannot see I feel like I'm not knocking on heaven's door Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door a knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. A knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Somebody, I'm sure somebody can play guitar, can play those four chords. Somebody out there, in fact, maybe somebody even in here. Can anyone here play guitar? I'm sure somebody, I'm sure somebody can sing. I'm sure somebody can, uh, can sing the words. We're gonna leave you here, leave you on TV Gaga. I wanna thank everybody for fighting us along. I wanna thank a lot of people for making it one of the best years of our lives. Thank you. Good night to you. It's a shame. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. Knock, knock.
I'm not